I can show you the world Shining, shimmering, splendid Tell me, princess, now when did you last let your heart decide? I can open your eyes Take you wonder by wonder over sideways and under On a magic carpet ride A whole new world A new fantastic point of view No one to tell us no Or where to go Or say we don't
Pastor Joseph Park from the Good News New York Church and together we'll be talking about eternal redemption. I'm very very happy that you are joining us here at the CLF. Everyone let us begin by reading the words from Luke chapter 15. We'll read from Luke chapter 15 verse 11. 
Luke 15, verse 11. I will read. And he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, and took his journey into a far country, and there wasted his substance with riotous living. And when he had spent all, there arose a mighty famine in that land, and he began to be in want. And he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. And when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and will say unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion, and ran, fell on his neck, and kissed him. And the son said unto him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. But the father said to his servants, Bring forth the best robe, put it on him. Put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Bring hither the fatted calf and kill it. Let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. I read 2 verse 24. Everyone, there's a story I want to tell you. Uh, there was a man, uh, he lived on a farm, and of course he owned many animals, uh, but he had a pet cat that he really loved. You know, he would always hold it, pet it, you know, brush his face against it, and he was a cat very, very dear to his heart. And of course he had many other animals, but he also had a donkey, and he would always put this donkey to hard work, make him carry a lot of things, uh, make him pull on the plow, etc. And then one day, this don donkey felt very upset. Why is it, why is it that the cat gets all the love? And why is it that the master puts me to all this hard, strenuous work? The cat doesn't do any work at all but it's always getting hugged, it's always getting pet, and the, the master's always smiling at it. But me, I do all kinds of work all day long, every day, yet the master never hugs me. The master never looks at me with a big smile on his face. The master never pets me. Why is that? The donkey was very, very upset. So the donkey began to think, all right, what does the cat do? What does the cat do that makes the master love him so much? So he looked very, very closely. And one day, you know, he saw the, the master was carrying the, the pet cat. And the cat was, you know, on the master's chest. And then the cat began to rub his face against the master's neck and the cheek. And then the master was so happy, he hugged him back and gave a nice petting. And also the master had a big old smile on his face. And when the donkey saw that, donkey said, Aha! I know what to do. If I rub my face against the master's neck, if I lean against his cheek and rub my face in, ah, then just like he hugged and he felt so happy towards the cat, the master is going to hug me and pet me and show me all kinds of love. And so one day the donkey was in the barn and then the master was walking by. And the master was walking by close enough where the donkey could shove his face in. So as soon as the master got close enough, the donkey began to rub his face into the master's neck and into the master's face. And then the master got stunned. Is this donkey crazy? What's wrong with this donkey? And then the master began to slap the donkey, curse at it, and push it away. And the master had this really angry look on his face. The donkey was so confused. What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? I did the same thing as the cat. 
But when the cat rubs his face and he gets loved and hugged and all this, all this good stuff. But when I do it, I get cursed at and I get slapped. What should I do? So once again, the donkey began to observe very carefully what the cat does. And then, you know, the donkey, one day the master was eating, uh, had a table set up, and the master was about to eat his breakfast and had a plate of milk next to him. And at, and at the plate of milk, the cat also sat at the table, and the cat began to <coughs> sip on the plate of milk. And when the master saw his cat sipping on the milk, the master had this look of, you know, love and warmth on his face, looking so, you know, uh, staring so uh, kindly down at the cat. And so the donkey thought, ah, I know what to do. Next time the master has breakfast and there's a plate of, a uh, plate of um, milk next to him, I'm going to go over there and sip the milk. Then master will look down at me lovingly too. So it became next day. Once, and the master was about to have his breakfast, and he set down a plate of milk next to him. And right then, the donkey barged in and began to sip on the milk. How do you think the master felt? Oh, my loving donkey. Do you think the master felt that way? Of course not, right? So the master once again got angry. Is this, is this donkey crazy? And kicked at it and slapped it and pushed it out and cursed at the donkey. This donkey's gone mad. And the donkey was very confused. What did I do wrong? What did I do wrong? Why is it that when the cat does it, he gets all kinds of love, but when I do it, I get nothing but a beating and hatred? Everyone, what did the donkey do wrong? The donkey didn't do anything wrong. But the donkey did not know one thing precisely. What is that? The donkey didn't know that it's a donkey. A cat is a cat and a donkey is a donkey. If it knew that it's not a cat, if it knew that it's a donkey, then donkey would realize that, trying to be all cute, rubbing his face and lapping on the milk, all of that would be in vain. He would know that even if he were to do all that, he'll never be able to get the kind of love the cat gets. But the donkey didn't know that he was a donkey. Therefore, he was trying to do all kinds of things that cat did, trying to receive the same kind of love. Everyone, why am I talking about this? This is the same thing in our spiritual life as well. Just as the donkey was bent on, what could I do? How could I do better? What more could I do? How could I make the master happy? So oftentimes, we are focused on, what can I do? What should I do? How well am I doing? How much am I doing? Or how poorly I am I doing? We get caught up in what I should do, what I have to do, and what I am doing. But before all that, the donkey must first realize that it's a donkey. Likewise, before all that, we must know clearly who we are in front of God. Once we know who we are clearly in front of God, spiritual life becomes very, very easy. If the donkey realizes that it's a donkey, that it's not a cat, it's not going to go through all of that vain effort trying to look all cute and good. It will know exactly what it should do. Likewise, when we know who we are exactly in front of God, instead of getting lost in our efforts and works and good deeds and trying to keep the Ten Commandments and praying and tithing. I got to do this. I got to do that. I got to do this. I got to do that. <sighs> Instead of living that kind of a spiritual life, where we need to go, what heart we need to have, what path we need to be on becomes very, very clear and it becomes very, very easy. Everyone, before you know, when you look on a map to go somewhere, what do we look for? We look for the destination. Oh, I got to go here. This is where I have to be. But before, although we do need to know the destination, to get to the destination, we must also know something very well. My current location. Where am I now? 
If we know our current location, it's easy to find the destination. But even though we know the destination, if you don't know where you are, the destination is to receive the Master's love. But if you don't know that you're a donkey, if you don't know where you are, it's going to be very, very difficult to get to the destination. However, once you know your current location, you just look at the map and you can find your way. Likewise, everyone, instead of getting lost in what good I have to do, I have to repent, I have to pray, I have to tithe, etc., etc., etc. Before all that, once we get to know who we are exactly in front of God, spiritual life becomes extremely easy. You know, <clears throat> I'm a pastor, I've been a pastor for a long time, and I've met with many people, and many people, many Christians, many people who go to church come to me and say, Pastor, I've been going to church for 10 years, 20 years, 30 years. I'm a deacon. I'm an elder. I'm a youth leader. I'm the men's leader, women's leader. But I have sin in my heart. I don't know what to do about my sins. I pray, I confess, I repent, and I really, really try my best. I cry tearfully, asking for forgiveness. I promise God with all my heart, I'll never do it again. But you know what, Pastor? I fall to these sins again and again, and I'm always in condemnation, always in shame, and always pounded by guilt. I don't know what to do. I fear, I have fear in my heart. I fear God's punishment. I fear damnation. God, Pastor, I don't know what to do. I've met a lot of people who go to church and still say that. It's not that they don't love God. It's not that they don't know the Bible. But in their hearts, they are still struggling mightily with sin inside of their hearts. Why? Like I said earlier, just like the donkey, they don't know who they are in front of God. They don't know what kind of a sinner they are in front of God. And I ask them, so what kind of sins do you struggle with? And of course, they tell me about their sins. Oh I, oh, I committed theft. I stole. Oh, I lied. I cheated. I struggled with lust. I struggled with hatred, etc., 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 etc. Yes, all of those things are sins. But everyone, we must clearly know what God is telling us sin is. We must clearly understand sin as God sees it. Then, everyone, we can be properly cured of sin. We can properly be redeemed of sin. Everyone, same thing with the disease. You have to have the disease properly diagnosed. Once the disease is properly revealed and diagnosed, then the right medication can be prescribed, the right surgery can be conducted, and that person can be precisely be healed of the sickness. You know, I had a sickness called cellulitis. It was an infection in the blood in the skin on my left leg. It was a form of staph infection. It was very, very painful, very, very difficult. And at the time, this was 2015, I was in Korea, and uh, I went to an uh, orthopedic hospital. And the doctor there, he was a very good doctor, and he treated me and treated me and treated me for 10 days. And I was on antibiotics for 10 days. It was very painful. You know, all kinds of needles, multiple times a day. You know, before that, I wasn't really st uh, scared of getting shots. But after that experience, you know, it kind of had a traumatic effect on me. I'm kind of scared of getting shots now. Anyhow, for 10 days, I was at that hospital in Korea, and I got a little better, but not really healed. And then I went back to the United States. I went back to the United States, and it flared up again. And my leg was in a lot of pain. I had very high fever. My fever went up to 43 degrees Celsius. Do you know what that is in Fahrenheit? 113 degrees. It's very high fever, right? And so the doctor asked me, did you, know, did you think you were going to die? You know, I said, yeah, I thought I was going to die when my fever hit that high. It was very, very painful. But when I got to the hospital in the United States, they uh, took a sample of my blood, and then 
they put it in different kinds of test tubes. I think they, I'm not exactly sure the process, but they cultivated the, the infection, the, the bacteria, the infection in my, in my uh, skin, and they cultivated it, put them in many different test tubes, and then they applied different kinds of uh, antibiotics. And they found the antibiotic that was very effective. It was called vancomycin. And I think it's a very powerful antibiotic. And so I was on that for uh, five days in the hospital in America. And then I became healed of cellulitis. So everyone, how did that happen? Yes, I got treatment. Yes, I was hospitalized in Korea. But when they did not know exactly what, uh, what, uh, what was causing this uh, pain, when, did not, when they did not know exactly what was effective against it, they could not heal me. But once they discovered, once they cultivated the bacteria from my skin, and then they saw what kind of medication was effective against it, I was able to be healed. In the same way, it's not just about going to church and trying to be good. It's not about that at all. But once we discover who we are exactly before God, we can receive the exact treatment to really have this eternal redemption be achieved in our hearts. Everyone, with this in mind, let us open to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 1. Isaiah chapter 1, <clears throat> verse 4. Isaiah chapter 1, verse 4. It says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors. They have forsaken the Lord. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backward. And when the Bible here in verse 4 tells us that we are a seed of evildoers, right? Not only are we evildoers, but we are a seed of evildoers. Right? Everyone, with this in mind, I want to read to you Romans chapter 5, verse 12. Romans chapter 5, verse 12 tells us, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. I'll read it to you. It says, By one man sin entered into the world. Everyone, what is this talking about? This is talking about Adam. Through Adam, sin entered into the world. What did Adam do? Adam ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. And here it says, by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. Earlier in Isaiah, we read that we are a seed of evildoers. Everyone, I am Korean. I am Korean. I was born in Korea. And because of that, actually right now, technically I'm a U.S. citizen, right? But I was born Korean, right? I was born Korean. And so, you know, I have Korean features, right? I have uh, black, black hair, you know, Asian face, Korean features. Why? Because I was born of a Korean seed. My last name is Park. Did I decide to be named Park? No. You know, the founder of CLF is Pastor Oksu Park, right? Pastor Oksu Park. Um, I am also Park. I am Pastor Joseph Park. Anyhow, I did not choose to be a Park. Did any of you choose your own last name? I don't think so, right? Oh, I want to be a Smith. Oh, I want to be Anderson. Oh, I want to be Howard, right? None of us did that, right? We were born and our last names were already given to us. Likewise, I was born a park. I didn't want to be it. I didn't not want to be it. I had no say in it whatsoever. But everyone, this is also true with sin. Here it says, by one man sin entered into the world. We were sinners by birth. Many people think I'm a sinner. Why? Oh, because I commit sins. Because I have hatred in my heart. Because I've committed theft. Oh, because I have lust in my heart. Oh, because I didn't honor my parents. Etc., 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 etc. I'm a sinner because I sinned. But everyone, that's not what the Bible tells us. 
the Bible tells us that you being a sinner actually had nothing to do with you. A friend of mine told me I'm a sinner because I commit sins. A person who plays baseball is called a baseball player. A person who commits sins is a sinner. But actually, the Bible tells us that sin entered the world through one man. Because of Adam, we were already sinners. By the time we were already uh, in our mother's womb, that's why David says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. David says that when he was being shaped, when are we shaped? We are shaped in the womb. And when he was conceived, right? At, at the conception, he says, I was conceived in sin. Why? Because we are already born of the seed of sin because of Adam who ate the fruit of the good and evil. Yes, a lot of us may think that we already know about that. Yeah, we do. But what I really want you to understand is, understand is that it had nothing to do with you. A lot of people make it about themselves. It's because I sinned. Because I wasn't good enough. Because I, I, I. A lot of people make it about themselves. But actually the Bible tells us it's not about you. It's not about you. But actually, how do we live life? Everything's about me, right? Everyone, do you like to watch movies? I like to watch movies. I like action movies and I like comedies, you know? I have a great time watching movies. I'm sure a lot of you like watching movies too. Everyone, when we watch movies, all the actors and actresses are good looking, right? For the most part, 95% of them, of actors and actresses are all good looking. Why? Why is that fun? Why? Why do, why do movies have to have good looking people for it to be fun? Shouldn't they have regular look, looking people? Then it'll be more realistic, more relatable, right? Why do movies always have to have good looking people? I'm sure you know the answer. It's because when we watch the movie, what do we like to think? We like to say, oh, that's me, right? That's what we like to feel when we watch a movie, right? Oh, that, that, that muscular superhero kicking all the bad guy's butt, that handsome guy is me. And he gets the pretty girl at the end. That's me. We like to feel that way. Right? Well, not just for men, women too. Oh, that beautiful girl, the heroine. She does all these heroic things and she gets with the hero at the end. Wow, that girl is me. Right? You don't want to look at an ugly looking person and go, that person is me. None of us want to do that, right? We want to look at good looking people and say in our hearts, that's me. That's why movies are fun. Everyone, that's our natural tendency to think our, of ourselves in a good way. That's our natural tendency, to, make our, to, to, make, to think of ourselves in a good light and to feel important of our, about ourselves and to think that what I do really, really matters and how I am has so much weight on everything. That's what we like to think of ourselves as. That may be true in this earthly world but it's not true in the world of God. It may be true in the way we live in our world, at school, at work, in our families. How you are is very important, but in the world of the Word of God, in the world of God, that's not important at all. It's not about you. You did not sinner become a sinner because of you. It's not about you. You became a sinner because of Adam. It's not about you. Through Adam, we became sinners. So already, without our, any of our input, without any of our doings, we were already doomed for damnation because we were born in the seed of sin because of Adam. And everyone, what did Adam do? God created Adam, <clears throat> and Adam had... Communion with God, right? 
Adam freely spoke with God. Adam freely received the guidance of God. Let me write the word God a little bigger so you can see it better. Right? They had free communion, and Adam freely received the guidance of God. And at that point, even though Adam was naked, it was not a problem. Eve was naked, it was not a problem. Why? Because they were in communion. They were in fellowship. And Adam wholly received the guidance of God. Meaning, in Adam's heart, God was the king in Adam's heart. God was the Lord in Adam's heart. God was God in Adam's heart. But this becomes broken. How does it get broken? Sin enters in. Right? Sin enters in, and this connection is broken. Right? Let me write this a little better for you. Sin enters in. Sin. And what was the sin that Adam committed? He ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? I'm sure you all know this very well. Adam ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil, and that's what became sin, and that's what broke the connection between Adam and God. But everyone, let's think about this. When we think of sin, what do we think of? We think of evil things. We think of sin and evil to be synonymous. Oh, sin, yeah, hatred, adultery, murder, cursing, fighting, stealing, etc., 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 right? When we think of sin, we think of evil things. But everyone, Adam ate the fruit of good and evil. It wasn't, and that was what became sin. It wasn't just the fruit of evil. Adam ate the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. What does this tell us? Under the umbrella of sin is not only evil, but also good. Let me say that one more time. Under the umbrella of sin is not only evil, but also good. Everyone, Genesis chapter 6 verse 5 tells us, And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that the imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God looked at the heart of man, and God describes it. Genesis 6 verse 5. And God describes the heart of man, and he says, Okay, it's 50% good and 50% evil. 30% good, 70% evil. No, no, 75% good, 25% evil. That's not what God says. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth and that the imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Continually. Only evil continually. Everyone, only evil is how much percent? 100%. Continually means how often? Always, without rest. God says man's heart is 100% evil 100% of the time. You know, when I first heard that Bible verse, I couldn't understand. What? 100% of evil 100% of time? Then what? Am I evil even when I'm brushing my teeth? Am I evil when I go to bed at night? I know I'm evil when I'm doing bad things with my friends, but am I evil when I got my mother a Mother's Day gift? Is that evil? I couldn't understand. But the important thing is, even though I didn't understand, that's what the Bible said. That the heart of man is only evil continually. In my eyes, I have some good. In my eyes, studying for a test is a good thing. In my eyes, oh, buying my mother a gift is a good thing. In my eyes, brushing teeth is not that evil. That's how things looked in my eyes. But God says, in His eyes, we're only evil continually. Everyone, let me expound upon that. How is that so? When Adam ate the fruit of good and evil, his communion with God was ended. It was cut. And then, what guides him now? Before Adam wholly followed God's decision and God's evaluation and God's judgment of things. But now, 
Who is Adam being guided by? What dictates how Adam lives? Let's open the Bible. Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together, and made themselves aprons. Everyone, when Adam and Eve ate the fruit of good and evil, the first thing that happened was, now their eyes were opened. Wait, were their eyes closed before? Did they walk around like this? You know, God, which way should I go? Right, left, right? Is that, is that, is that how they were? No. Their eyes were obviously open before this, but what does this mean? Their eyes, eyes of them both were opened. Everyone. Before, Adam saw, but he did not judge. What is good? What is evil? What should I put on clothes, not put on clothes? Adam did not, was not led by his own decision of things. What was Adam led by? Adam was led wholly by God. But after eating the fruit of good and evil, the eyes of both of them were opened. What does that mean? From then on, they were no longer led by God, but their own standard of good and evil their own standard of good and evil. Everyone, all people live following their standard of good and evil. Let me give you an example. Smoking. Is smoking a good thing? Most of you will say, no, ah, smoking is bad for your health. Right? I don't smoke. My father was a very heavy smoker. I asked my dad, why do you smoke so much? Oh, I get headaches if I don't smoke. I can't get through the day without smoking. So, my father and I, we had different opinions. In my eyes, smoking is bad. So, in my eyes, I don't smoke. My father, how, on the other hand, he knows it's bad for his health, but at the same time, in his mind, it is more good than bad. What do you mean? In his mind, the pleasure he gets the relief of stress that he gets, and the lack of headaches that he can uh, have, the, the lack of headaches, right? The lack of pain through smoking. That is greater than the badness of smoking. So in my father's mind, according to my father's standard of good and evil, smoking is good. According to my standard of good and evil, smoking is bad. And this is how all people live. Based, this is what they how go about life, you know, in all aspects of life, continually judging what is good, what is evil, how much does it benefit me, is, is it worth it, is it not worth it, you know, how should I live? That's what people live by according to their standard of good and evil. And it's different for all people. Once I asked a brother in the church, Brother, is it good to give $20 to a homeless person? And the brother said, No, it's not. And I was kind of shocked. Well, the homeless guy is hungry. You know, he, if you give him $20, he can go buy hamburgers. But then the brother was explaining, no, you shouldn't give $20 to the homeless. I asked him why. It was because if you give it to them, more often not, than not, they'll use it to get drugs. So it made me think. In my point of view, according to my standard of good and evil, giving $20 to the homeless is a good thing. But according to that brother's standard of good and evil, Giving $20 to the homeless is an evil thing. Why? Because they're going to go do drugs with it. I'm not saying somebody's right and somebody's wrong. But what I am saying is that all people live being dictated by their own standard of good and evil. And that's exactly what happened to Adam as well. How? Adam ate the fruit of good and evil and the eyes of both of them were opened. Before, even though they had eyes, it was God who guided them. It was God who told them. It was God who led them. But now they had their own eyes to judge 
for themselves. I think this is good. I think this is bad. And what was the first thing that they judged? They looked at themselves. Oh, we're naked. We're naked. Oh, this isn't good. We should cover this up. This is shameful. We should cover this up. So they got fig leaves and made aprons and they covered their nakedness. Their standard of good and evil is at work. They judged it to be evil that they were naked and they judged it good to cover themselves. Right? You're with me, right? So what is sin? People think terrible, wicked things. That's what sin is. God says, no. Under the umbrella of sin is the standard of good and evil. The state of man having separated from God and now living through their own standard of good and evil. That's what sin is. Let me repeat that. People think of sin as adultery, theft, hatred, etc. Yes, those things are sins too. Yes, those things are bad. I'm not saying those things are good. But fundamentally, at the root, at the core, is what? Man separated from God and are no longer living with, under the guidance of God, but under the guidance of their own standard of good and evil. In, a, in essence, God was replaced by their own standard of good and evil. God was replaced by sin. This is the state of man in sin. You know, <clears throat> that's why Luke chapter 15 that we read today illustrates this point very, very well. The younger son said to the father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And the father divided unto them his living. And the younger son took the wealth and went to a faraway country and lived riotously. Everyone, what does that tell us? Before, the younger son lived with his father as the master. Right? He lived at the father's house. The father was the master. The father was king. The father was guide. God. He was under the lordship of the father. But what did the younger son too do? He took the wealth and went to a faraway country. And in the faraway country, who is the king? Who is the Lord? Who is dictating his life? Himself. Himself. Hey everyone, this is before all the riotous living of the younger son. So this is what we have to understand, everybody. Before we talk about adultery, theft, this and that, and this and that, we have already departed from God. The younger son has departed from the father. The younger son has departed from the father's domain and went to the domain where he himself is king. And that's what has happened to us as well. And this all happened to us even before we were born. How? When Adam ate the fruit of good and evil. That's why God says you're a seed of evildoers. And that's why God says to us, that we are only evil continually. And on top of that, God says to us that sin entered the world and death by sin. Everyone, <clears throat> with this in mind, let me explain to you a little bit further about this. Okay, just give me a second as I erase. So earlier we read that... <clears throat> Earlier we read that <clears throat> we are the seed of evildoers. We are the seed of sin. We're already born with sin in our hearts. Everyone, <clears throat> in our hearts is all kinds of things, right? There is, you know, hatred, greed, lust, arrogance, deceit, pride, all kinds of terrible things in our hearts. But everyone, do we just live out those things? We don't, right? I hope you don't. <laughs> you know, I'm a pastor, right? So my job is to preach the word of God. And I fellowship people. I lead people to Jesus. I preach the gospel. I lead people to salvation. That's my job. But everyone, do you know what also goes on in my heart? Even though I'm a pastor... I'm human, right? <laughs> I'm human. 
So all kinds of wickedness, sinful thoughts, greed, hatred, lust, all of those things are in my heart as well. Everyone, those things are in our hearts. But we don't, they don't just come out. We don't reveal them. We just keep, keep them bottled up. But even though we keep them bottled up, they still pop out. Everyone, we have sin in our hearts, but there are many layers that keep our sins inside. Everyone, with this in mind, let's read a Bible verse. 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 16. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 7. I will read for you. <clears throat> but the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh on the heart. Okay? One more time it says, oh, For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. Everyone, we have sin in our hearts, right? This is invisible. But even though we have sin in our hearts, there are many layers, barriers that keep this sin from popping out. The first barrier is our conscience. That is the first barrier, our conscience, right? The second barrier is social norms. Going back to conscience, when you have an evil thought, what does the conscience tell you? Stop it. That's bad. Stop it. Stop it, right? So evilness arises, but conscience just pushes it down, pushes it down, pushes it down. It's not that it's not there, but conscience works to push down our sin. Norms. Let me write this a little bigger so you can see it better. Norms. Social norms is the second barrier. Second layer that keep our sins from popping out. What are norms? You know, for example, respect your elders. Once I was riding on the subway and somebody hit me in the back hard as he walked by. And I went to turn and curse at him, but I saw he was an elderly man. So my curse words came all the way up here. But then I remember the social norm, respect your elders. So I mm, pushed it back down, right? Social norms, it's not that I didn't want to curse at him. It's not that well, I didn't have hatred in my heart against him. It's not that I wasn't angry, but social norms made me push it back down, right? Social norms. And finally, the last layer that keeps our sins from popping out is, the, is what? Laws, right? Laws and consequences. For example, I want to commit theft. I don't care about my conscience. I don't care social norms, right? I want to go steal it. I want it. But why can't I do it? Because I'm afraid of the law. I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to be punished. I hate that guy. I want to kill him. I don't care if that's the right thing or wrong thing. I hate him so much, I'm going to kill him. Well, why can't I? Because I don't want to go to jail, right? So the laws act as the most powerful barrier to make us bottle up our sins inside. But does that mean it's not there? No, it's still there. So what happens? We have sin in our hearts. For example, uh, greed. Right? Greed. We have greed in our hearts. Gre Everybody has greed in their hearts. But when greed gets bigger and bigger and bigger, it will manifest itself as theft. Okay? Another example, we have lust in our hearts. Wow, that woman looks so beautiful. I wish I could spend the night with her, right? We have lust in our hearts. And for the most part, oh, no, no, I shouldn't feel that way. No, 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 no. We push it back in. But if that heart grows and grows and grows, lust will manifest itself as adultery. Okay, I hope you can see this well. Adultery, right? And lastly, last example, you have hatred in your heart. 
And if hatred grows and grows and grows, it will manifest itself as murder. Murder. Okay? Death, adultery, murder. Now, these are all bad things. If people commit these things, what do we say? Oh, terrible person, theft, adultery, murder. These things are all visible to the eyes. But everyone, in 1 Samuel 16, verse 7 that we just read, what did it say? For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. Man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. What do people look at? People look at the outward appearance. And when they say, I struggle with sin, they want to get rid of these things. Sins that appear on the outside, or the sins that you can feel yourself, like hatred or greed, these kinds of things that happen in your heart. But what is God pointing out? God is pointing out the sin at the core of your heart. The man looketh on the outward appearance, but the Lord looketh upon the heart. Lord looketh upon the heart. But everyone, if that's the case, what happens? It's not about these things. Right? Whether you're a person who's done these things, or who haven't done these things, at the end of the day, everyone is all the same, the seed of sin. All the same. Whether you've committed these things or not. A lot of people, oh, I wish I don't do this anymore. I wish I don't cheat anymore. I wish I don't steal anymore. I wish I'm not so hateful anymore. People are all concerned about things. But before all that, God wants to let us know. Whether you did those things or not, God looks at the sin in your heart. That's why, you know, <clears throat> When we have retreats in Korea, thousands and thousands of people come. And thousands and thousands of people come, and they, uh, they eat. And when they eat, they eat Korean food. So Korean food is like kimchi, and oftentimes we serve fish and beef soup, whatnot. And so people take their leftover foods, and they dump it in this tub. This tub. And it's, I mean, if they just dump the food, it gets kind of stinky. So we, uh, it's a tub filled with water. And so, you know, they throw away, there's rice. There is pieces of kimchi. There's, you know, fish bones, right? There's all kinds of food leftovers. You know, and thousands of people, you know, dump their food. But you know what? The funny thing is, after they dump the food, if you spend one night, all the food, leftover food, seep to the bottom of the bucket, to the very bottom. And because it's at the bottom, uh, the upper part of the water, the upper part, actually looks clear. It actually looks clear. So, this water looks really, really clear. Does that mean it's drinkable? Would you drink it? Oh, of course not, Pastor. What are you talking about? You're right. It looks clear, but at the bottom of it is all kinds of nasty, dirty, leftover stuff. It's not drinkable. So is our hearts. On the outside, I'm a father, I'm a pastor, I'm this, that, I'm a good man. But God looks at your heart. At the very bottom of your heart are all kinds of dirty, nasty things. And so, even though it looks clear, if you put in a stick and you stir it up, what happens? It's all going to come out, right? It's all going to come out to the top. And this is exactly like our hearts, everyone. So, that is the state of our hearts in front of God. Everyone, with this in mind, let us open to Job. Job chapter 35. Job chapter 35. Job chapter 35. <clears throat> 
verse 5. Look unto the heavens and see. Behold, the clouds which are higher than thou. If thou sinnest, what doest thou against him? Or if thy transgressions be multiplied, what doest thou unto him? If thou be righteous, what givest thou him? Or what receiveth he of thine hand? Thy wickedness may hurt a man as thou art, and thy righteousness may profit the Son of Man. Everyone, <clears throat> here in verse 5 it says, Look unto the heavens and see, behold, the clouds which are higher than thou. Everyone, when we look at ourselves, we for the most part compare ourselves with our neighbors. I'm not as good as him, but at least I'm better than him. I'm not as faithful as that pastor, but at least I'm more faithful than that pastor. Oh, at least, you know, I'm not as sinful as him, but at least I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as sinful, I'm, I'm, I'm not as sinful as him, you know, on and on and on, right? We're always measuring and comparing ourselves with other people, right? And not only with our spiritual life, but also with wealth or whatever. Oh, I'm not as rich as him, but I got more money than him. Oh, my kids aren't as fine as your kids, but my kids are better than his kids, right? Or um, I'm not as handsome as that guy, but I'm better looking than that guy. We may not say it out loud, right? Because, you know, that's kind of childish and you sound stupid. But all of us think that in our hearts. But here God says, Look unto the heavens and see. You know, once I went up to the Empire State Building, uh, I think 88th story, 88th floor is the obser uh, observatory deck, right? So I looked down from the observatory deck down to the streets. You see little cars going back and forth, and you see little people walking around. You know, when you're at ground level with them, you can tell, wow, that guy is tall. Wow, this guy is skinny. Wow, this guy is short. You can tell, right, when you're at ground level with them. But when you look down from Empire State Building, you couldn't tell who's tall. You couldn't tell who was fat or skinny. You couldn't tell who was short. They're just like little dots walking around. Everybody looked the same. You know, here it says, look unto the heavens and see. What does that mean? Don't see yourself by comparing yourself to your friends and neighbors and cousins. But look at yourself from God's point of view. And that's what we were doing. Seeing yourself from God's point of view. Right? And here, what does God say? If thou sinnest, what doest thou against him? Or if thy transgressions be multiplied, what doest thou unto him? Everyone, if we sin, what is that to God? If we transgress, do we really take away from God? Do we lessen God? Do we really damage God? Do we really do that? The answer is no. Us committing sins is a big deal to us. But do our sins, is, it a big, is our sins a big deal to God? Does it take away from God? Does it damage God and hurt God? No. To God, it's nothing at all. What does the very next verse say? If thou be righteous, what givest thou him? Or what receiveth he of thine hand? Suppose I'm righteous. Suppose I do good things, righteousness, all, and then bring it forth to God. Everyone, does that then profit God? Is that going to add on to God? Is that going to help God? Is that going to make God more beautiful? What do we think? Or oh, if I do something good, God's going to be so pleased. Because it's a big deal to us, we think it's a big deal to God too. Oh, I did this, I tied it, I helped my neighbor, blah, 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 blah. Oh God, here you go. But here, what does it tell us? If you're righteous, what givest thou him? If you, if you uh, and thy righteousness, what does it say? And, and what receiveth he of thine hand? What could God possibly receive of us? Nothing at all. You know, there's a funny story. Uh, in Korea, they make this sauce called doenjang. It's made out of beans. And what you do is you, you, know, you go, you dip, dip, dill the beans in salt and you do this and that. But the main part of it is, after it's all very uh, dilled in salt, you have to put it in a jar underground for about a year. 
to make it ferment. And then after it ferments for a year, it, it turns into tasty uh, bean paste sauce. Uh, but one day, but somehow, somehow, uh, flies make their way in there. And they lay their eggs and like uh, maggots grow. So one day, one maggot and another maggot met. One maggot was from an outhouse. And so this maggot was all covered with dung and piss. But this maggot was from the denjang sauce jar. So he's from a cleaner place. And the two of them were talking. And the maggot from the outhouse was saying, Oh, you know, I'm so miserable. I'm always covered in dung and piss. It's so disgusting, blah, blah, blah. And then the other maggot was from the sauce jar. And the other maggot was all high and proud. Yeah, I'm from the sauce jar. You know, it's so clean where I'm from. And you, you live in all that dung and piss. Oh my gosh, I feel sorry for you. You're so disgusting. Yeah, you're so, you get to live in the sauce jar. I envy you so much. I wish I get to go there one of these days. And the two of them were talking. But then a person came along. The person looked down. He saw two maggots. What do you think he did? Which one do you think he killed? That's right. He killed both of them. He stepped on both of them, smushed it, and continued his way without giving it another second of his thought. Why? He should have just killed the dirty one, right? And the other one's clean. No. He kills both of them. Why? Why? Because everyone... A maggot is a maggot. Whether you're from the outhouse, whether you're from the, whether you're from the denjang sauce, a maggot is a maggot. Everyone, that's who we are. Whether we've done good, whether we've done evil, like I illustrated to you, we are of the seed of sin. A sinner is a sinner. Whether he commits a lot of sins, or whether he commits a little bit of sins, whether he does good or evil, Sinner is a sinner. A maggot is a maggot. And that's what God is telling us in Job 35. You committed a lot of big, committed evil sins? Great, you're still a sinner. On the flip side, you did a lot of good things and righteous things? Great, you're still a sinner. Everyone, what does the world tell us? If you're good, your points go up. If you do poorly, your points go down. But what does the Bible say? You do good, you're still a zero. You're a sinner. Or whether you do bad, you're still a zero. You're a sinner. That's what this is telling us. If you transgress, what is that to God? It is nothing. If you do righteously, what is that to God? It is nothing. Then, what does it say in verse 8? Job 35, verse 8. Thy wickedness may hurt a man as thou art, and thy righteousness may profit the son of Man, everyone, our wickedness will, will summon condemnation and punishment from man. And our righteousness will bring applause from man. But in front of God, it's nothing. It's nothing. Why am I telling you this? Because I want you to understand, like I said earlier, it's not about you. What are we so concerned and caught up about all the time? How good am I? How good am I? How well am I doing? Right? But God, the Bible is telling us, whether you do well, you're a zero. Whether you do poorly, you're a zero. It's not about you. Ah, it's not about me. It's not about me. And everyone, once you understand that, once we see this, what can we do? We can shift the focus off of ourselves. Before, we're always looking at ourselves. What am I doing? How much am I doing? How well am I doing? Right? Those again and again, right? What am I doing? How much am I doing? How well am I doing? Always looking at ourselves. Always measuring ourselves. Always weighing ourselves. But once we get to know it's not about us. Ah, it's not about me. It's not about me. It's about, it's not about me. It's not about how, oh, then I need Grace. I need somebody else's help. It's not up to my goodness. Everyone, 
to help us understand this, God gave us the law. Everyone, you know what the law is, right? The Ten Commandments that Moses received on Mount Sinai. Everyone understanding that because we are the seed of sin, that it's not about us, is to truly understand sin through God's eyes. But still, people fail to understand this. People still think, but I'm still pretty good. I'm not that bad. But everyone, that's why God gave us the law. Everyone, from Adam to Moses was a period of around 2,500 years from Adam to Moses. And during that time was before the law came. And during that time, people had sinned, but they were guided by their conscience. But conscience was not effective in revealing the sin in people's hearts. So at the time of Moses, God gave them the law, the Ten Commandments. God gave them the law, and through the law, God allowed them to see (coughs) who they are in front of God. So God gave them the law. Everyone, the law is composed of 613 laws. Of course, we know them as the Ten Commandments. But actually, the Ten Commandments is a very, very simplified version of the law, which consists of 613 laws. So many do's, so many don'ts. I don't even know them all, right? But so many laws that detail what what is to be done. But anyhow, we summarize this into the Ten Commandments. Commandment 1, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make idols unto yourself. You shall not take the Lord thy God's name in vain. You shall remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. Honor thy parents. Thou shalt not murder. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not covet. And thou shalt not, uh, excuse me, thou shalt not give false testimony. And thou shalt not covet. These are the Ten Commandments. And then God gave them the law and God said, If you keep them all, you'll be blessed. Right? So the Ten Commandments is actually a summary of the 613 laws. And God tells them that if you keep them all, you'll be blessed. From with that in mind, please open to Deuteronomy chapter 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28. I will read to you from verse 1. <clears throat> Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 1. And it came to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all the nations of the earth, and and all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, blessed shalt thou be in the field, blessed shall be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Blessed shall be thy basket, and thou and thy store. Blessed shalt thou be when thou comest in, and blessed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Here it says, blessing, 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 blessing. Blessed if you what? Let's look at verse 1. If you shall hearken diligently unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe and to do all his commandments, I command thee this day. These blessings aren't free. If you keep all the commandments, these blessings are yours. People are blinded. Oh, I want to be blessed. And the Bible says if you keep the commandments, you'll be blessed. Okay, I'm going to keep the commandments. Yeah, blessings are great, but it says if you keep all the commandments. Everyone, can you keep all the commandments all the time? It'd be nice to be get to get these blessings, but actually if you really think about this, this is a pie in the sky. You wish you could have it, but you'll never get it. It's a pie in the sky. Oh, blessings. Yeah, let's get blessed. But well, then what should I do? Oh, we got to keep all the commandments. If you, it says, keep all the commandments, not do your best. People think, oh, I did my best, so it should be acceptable. No, that's not what God said. 
God didn't say if you do your best, you'll be blessed. If you keep them all. And then it explains to us furthermore about curses. Chapter 28, verse 15 of Deuteronomy. But it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe to do all his commandments and his statutes which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. Cursed shalt thou be in the city, cursed shalt thou be in the field, cursed shall be thy basket and thy store, and cursed shall be the fruit of thy body, for the fruit of thy land, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of thy sheep. Cursed shalt thou be, cur uh, shalt thou be when thou comest in, and cursed shalt thou be when thou goest out. Here it says, curse, 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 curse. And who is to be cursed? Oh, not me. Curses for somebody else. Somebody who did terrible things like murder, that kind of stuff. No, here it says, if you will not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God to observe, to do all his commandments and statutes. If you don't do all his commandments and statutes, if you don't keep all 613 laws, you are cursed. That is what the law is telling us. Everyone, people don't know the law exactly, precisely. Everyone... <clears throat> Phone number has how many digits, right? It's got 10 digits, right? Three area code and then seven digit number, right? So that's how it is in the USA, 10 digits. Suppose you get nine out of 10. Ooh, that's 90%, that's pretty good. Will you be able to make the phone call? Will you be able to connect? No. Suppose you got eight digits, seven digits. No, you will not be able to connect. Even though you get 9 out of 10 digits of the phone number right, you will not be able to connect. What has to happen? You have to have all 10 digits exactly. Suppose you had 9 digits right, and then on the 10th digit, you were just off by 1. It was a 6, but you pressed a 5 instead. Then will you get close? No. Still not going to connect. Likewise, people don't know about the law of God precisely. People just think, if I do my best, God will be happy. If I try more, God will be happy. If I was better than yesterday, well, compared to last week, I commit a lot less sins now. That's an improvement. God should be happy about that. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if you observe to do all His commandments, everyone, that is the requirement of the law. It's not try your best. It's not best out of a 5 out of 10, 7 out of 10. You must keep them all the time. Let us open to the Bible. Galatians chapter 3. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. Galatians chapter 3, verse 10. For as many as are of the works of the law, are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them. Everyone here it says, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law. Does it say cursed are those who keep 30% of the law? Cursed are those who really don't try their best to keep the law. Everyone, the Bible gives us the exact standard of how the law should be kept. It's not to the best of your abilities. It's not better than yesterday. What is it? To continue in all things of the law. You must keep all the laws all the time. Otherwise, you are cursed. We don't even know 613 laws. Do you know them all? I don't think so. I don't know them all. I haven't met one person who can remember all 613 laws. I've met many pastors, many Christian leaders, many theologians. Nobody does. All 613 laws. Yet, how can you keep them all if you don't even know them all? But here it says, if you did not keep them all, all the time, you are cursed. Everyone, what does an x-ray do? What does the MRI do? What does the CAT scan do? To the naked eye, you cannot see 
the sickness in your body. But the x-ray will reveal the broken bone. The MRI, the CAT scan or whatever, will reveal the disease inside of you. And so is the law. People think I'm fine. I'm okay. Oh, I'm a good father. I'm a good neighbor. You know, my uncle's a drunk who beats his wife and, and abuses his children. Me, I'm an upstanding citizen. Therefore, I must be fine. People judge themselves with their own subjective standards. And to them, God gives them the law. All right, let's, measure, let's be measured by the law. Did you keep all the laws perfectly? Are you worthy to be blessed in front of God? Nope, 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 you failed. That's why the Bible tells us, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. But that's why God gave us the law to reveal the fact that we are sinners unto us. Without getting the MRI, even though there's cancer inside of you, you might think you're healthy. Even though your bone is broken, you might think, oh, it's just a bad bruise. You might think you're okay. But what does the MRI and the x-ray do? It reveals the seriousness of the disease inside of you. Look, you have cancer. Look, you have a broken bone. And that's what it reveals to you. Likewise, people think they're fine. Oh, I'm a good neighbor. I'm a good husband. I'm a teacher. I'm a deacon. I go to church. I'm fine. But when they're actually measured against the law, when the x-ray is taken, when the MRI is taken, what does it reveal? That they have failed to keep the law, that they are sinners, and that they are under the curse. And that's what God wants to have us understand and realize. Ah, I am completely doomed under sin. Yeah, even though I didn't commit mass murder and adultery and all these terrible things, in God's eyes, I fall far short of keeping all the laws. Then I am cursed in God's eyes. Let's go one more verse. James chapter 2, verse 10. The book of James chapter 2, verse 10. What does it say? For whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Let me read to you one more time. For whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Suppose somehow you kept 612 out of the 613 laws. That's pretty good. But even though you kept the whole law, you offend in one point, you're guilty of them all. You're guilty of them all. Suppose there's two people who suffer from the AIDS virus. One person has 10,000 AIDS viruses in his body. Another person has one AIDS virus in his body. Can the person with one AIDS virus say to the man with the 10,000 viruses, Oh, I'm, I'm so much healthier than you. Look, you got 10,000 AIDS viruses. I only got one. Huh? I'm so much better than you. Can you say that? No. Whether you have 10,000 AIDS viruses, whether you have one AIDS virus, what is it? You both have AIDS and you're both going to die. It's all the same, right? Everyone, this is the same thing with sin. Whether you've committed five sins, ten sins, or a thousand sins, one sin alone, it says, you have broken one, you are guilty of them all. So what is the purpose of the law? To reveal to the, the fact unto us that we are guilty sinners. That we are powerless sinners. That no matter how hard we try, we cannot defeat sin. No matter how hard we try, we cannot keep the commandments. Suppose from today on, I keep the commandments well, somehow. Well, then does that undo all the previous breakings of the commandments? No, it does not. You've broken one, you're already guilty of them all. That's why in Romans chapter 3, it tells us exactly the purpose of the law. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Romans chapter 3, verse 19. Now we know 
that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Everyone here it says, it tells us the purpose of the law. We know that what thing the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped, and all the world may become guilty before God. Everyone, it says, every mouth be stopped. Everyone, when do, when do our mouths like to go off? When you are proud of something, right? <clears throat> yeah. Hmm. I, uh, you know, I uh, graduated from Harvard University. Oh, yeah. My son uh, just, you know, got hired by this famous company, right? Of course, there's difference among people. But when you're proud of something, when you know you've done well, when you've succeeded in something, what do you want to do? You want to talk about it, right? You, want, you cannot keep your mouth shut. Of course, you know, there's difference. Some people, they just want to be very modest and, and you know, just you know, keep cool about it. But in the heart, at least, you feel proud of it. You hope others recognize it and you want to say it. That is the human heart. But here, what does the law do? Every mouth may be stopped. Why? Because in front of the law, you're guilty. You're ashamed. I'm a sinner. I have failed. Everyone, when you have failed, when you're guilty, when you're shameful, what happens? Do you, oh, I'm guilty. I'm ashamed. I failed. Do we do that? What happens? Right? You, wanna, you hope nobody sees you. You hope nobody notices you. You don't make a sound. You know, you, you can't speak up. You're guilty. You're ashamed. You have failed. And that's what the law does to us. That every mouth may be stopped. Why? Because our mouth is full of boasting. I did this. I did that. I did this. I'm so good. I but Every mouth may be stopped. I'm a sinner. I'm guilty. I'm ashamed. You know, I used to think I was better than that neighbor who always got drunk and did terrible things to his family. But in God's eyes, I'm no better than him. You know, I always thought I was better than the drug dealers and the prostitutes. But in God's eyes, I'm no different from them. You know, I always thought I was such a good husband and a good Christian, a good father. Well, when measured against the law, I'm worthy of curse. That's what the law does to us. That is the purpose of the law, that every mouth may be stopped and the world may become guilty before God. And that includes you, that the world may become guilty before God. But people thought the purpose of the law the wrong way. Let me try. Let me keep it. If I can't keep them all, but I'll do my best and God will be proud of me. No, they understood it the whole completely the wrong way. Verse 20. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Here it says, For by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. By keeping the law, nobody can be justified. Through your efforts, through your works, through your goodness, you cannot add even one thing to your salvation, to your justification. By the deeds of the law shall no flesh be justified. Why? For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Everyone, that is the purpose of the law. By the law is the knowledge of sin. Ah, oh, I failed to keep the law. I'm a sinner. Everyone, the x-ray does not create the broken bone in you. Everyone, the MRI does not create the cancer in you. But rather, it reveals to you the knowledge of your disease, the knowledge of your broken bone. Likewise, the law does not create sin in us. But rather, it reveals to us the fact that we are born in sin. That we are powerless against sin. That no matter what we do, we cannot defeat sin. That we cannot keep the commandments and that we are under the curse. That is the purpose of the law. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. But everyone, so many people, many, many Christians, many, many pastors, they know the law the wrong way. Do it. Do it. Try better. Try better. Do it. Do it. 
Okay, let me try better. Let me try more. Let me be better. And they fail and fail and fail and fail. Okay, let me try better. Let me regroup. Let me regroup. And they go on for five years, 10 years, 20 years without any kind of assurance in their hearts. <coughs> Everyone, that is not what the law is for. For the law is the knowledge of, of sin. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Everyone, through the law, God reveals to us who we are in God's eyes. <coughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Through the law, God reveals what sinners we are in front of Him, how doomed under sin we are, how powerless against sin we are, and that through our efforts and works, we cannot get justification. Everyone, this is very important to understand. Why? Because then we'll understand it's not about you. If we think that we could add on to our salvation, if we think that we could add on to defeating sin, then what happens? You th your goodness matters. Your effort matters. So it has to be about you. But God says no. None of it can help our justification and that we have failed and that we have fallen far short, God reveals that to us to make us understand and confess before him, God, I cannot defeat sin. God, I am weak. God, I am unable. God, I am nothing but a bundle of sin. My good deeds, it's worth nothing. It's hypocrisy. God, I am nothing but a pile of sin. And everyone, when we get to acknowledge that in our hearts, when we get to really confess that from the bottom of our hearts, then everyone, we can look our eyes off of ourselves and look onto what God has prepared for us. Everyone, in the story of the prodigal son, it's not the fact that the prodigal son lived riotously, drinking, spending money on the harlots. Yes, those things are bad. But it was the fact that first and foremost, he had departed from the father. His heart went from his father being the king of his life to himself being the king of his life. Likewise, through Adam, we, God was the king of our lives. But through Adam, we departed and went to a life where our own standard of good and evil where sin and ourself became the king of our lives. And there we were doomed in sin. And there we try to keep the law, but we failed. And that's who we are in front of God. And everyone, that's what sin is. Sin is not just lying, cheating, fighting. Yes, those things are sin too. But understanding this nature of sin, then we can truly shift the focus off of us and focus upon what God has prepared for us. Everyone, I will continue tomorrow. This eternal redemption uh, class is for three days. So I will continue tomorrow and the day after. So everyone, please be sure to join me again and we'll continue exactly how then we can obtain redemption and how then that redemption is eternal. So everyone, please be sure to uh, join me again tomorrow. Thank you so much. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. Lord, for a long time we thought that sin was just doing bad things and breaking the commandments. Yes, those things are sin too. But Lord, we have been doomed by sin already from Adam. And Lord, because we are of the seed of sin, no matter what we do, we could only fail. Whosoever shall keep the whole law, yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Lord, that is who we are. We are weak and powerless. Our good is nothing but filthy rags. Father God, may we shift the focus off of us and learn that it's not about ourselves and see through the word what you have prepared for us. Lord, please bless the CLF conference and allow many pastors to truly receive this eternal redemption in their hearts. Lord, we thank you. Please bless this tomorrow and the day after as we continue. We trust everything into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Thank you very much. See you tomorrow.